there we go we're live there's always some time here maybe that people are watching us and can hear me right now but i'm not saying anything we're not actually officially in the show yet but oh, that's so i can't believe i don't know how long we're doing the couch another first time guest of long overdue first time guest staying alive staying alive uh, uh, who are we most excited to hear about when camp opens that and more this week's on the couch on the couch finally way too long frank schwab frank schwab the first uh, audible in joke yahoo sports you know him you love him you love the nfl what team do you love to hear about who are you anticipating hearing about frank when camps probably open in a couple months I, can I say all 32? I'm just excited for sure. football. But, you know, I think let, let's just get out of the way. I, Tampa Bay, obviously. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Arizona, obviously. I think yeah. Miami, just because of Tua's health, obviously. But the one I'm really thinking about is Cincinnati. Because mm. I think this team could be really exciting. I, I don't know. I This could be the kind of like last year's Arizona where they're scoring a lot of points. Defense might not be good, but they're interesting to watch. How's Joe Burrow going to look without really a regular offseason? Is A.J. Green healthy? Is, I mean, how does T. Higgins get into the offense? Mm-hmm. I think there's just a lot of moving parts in Cincinnati. They're not going to be good, but they could be very interesting. And I think that camp, if we have camp, camp is going to give us a lot of answers that we just don't have right now. And we could end up at the end of camp saying, this Cincinnati team is going to be one to watch. Right. They, they, they might go 6-10, and 10, but they might also score 31 a game. We, we just don't know because there, there's a lot of variables in play with them. Yeah, get the cruise ship pointed in the right direction. Although maybe cruises will be a thing of the past. Get the the, the battleship pointed in the right direction. It takes right. a while to turn it, but you can see when the turn is happening. And we actually this morning had a little exchange about Cincinnati at Seattle last year and how well Cincinnati played and right. really you know, snatched defeat from the jaws of victory in that game. Uh, and how um, I, I think when you mentioned Miami, I'm sorry, when you mentioned Seattle or Cincinnati. Sorry, my brain. I'm, it's because I'm so excited. Again, folks, Frank Schwab, Yahoo yeah, Sports. All, all go, 32, all man. Wait. We could talk all 30. I want to talk all 30. Get at least yeah. one line in on all 32. Right, so Seattle, right. Seattle, Cincy, whatever you got, Exactly. Man, go. Well, because our brain is popping as each day and things can change, it looks more likely that we'll get football in yeah. some shape or form. But Cincinnati, of course, is most interesting uh, because of the idea of Joe Burrow as a transformational pig- figure. You know, mm-hmm. like, like no doubt I'm Mayor Nair Street. No doubt, uh, just as a placebo almost for everybody in the organization, Joe Burrow coming into the building means a lot. And remember, last year at this time, we were talking about how the old ha-ha is Sean McVay in your Rolodex, you might get hired uh, as offensive coordinator or head coach. And Zach Taylor was seen as the most absurd extent of that, right? Uh, But he did bring in Brian Callahan, who was kind of a, a, a hot name, and... Now we'll see what they can do, although offensive line is a question. But as you say, you add in T. Higgins, we'll see about A.J. Green. Um, and, you know, on defense, uh, they have a feisty group, especially uh, in, in the front seven. Uh, and, yeah, th- they could be a tough out. And as Arizona, you mentioned Arizona, they showed last year things are going in the right direction. With Arizona, is DeAndre Hopkins that same kind of transformational figure for them? I think so. I You know, I, I, I sit here and I try to figure out What's that, what are his numbers going to look like? Is it going to look the same? Right. I don't know because they like to they, they, they're going to like to spread it out, spread it around. I don't know that he's going to get 180 targets. I just don't know if he's that guy there. But as a football player, yes, I I, I almost looked at that. I don't want to overstate this. You know how we get in the off season. We overstate a lot yeah. of things. But I looked that at that trade as we're going to look back on this day, and you know, five years down the road, we're going to say that's the day the Arizona Cardinals' fortunes changed. Because basically an all-world receiver dropped in their lap. I, how right. often does that happen? Where not only did you not have to pay for him, really, you shed one of your worst contracts. It, it, we've all talked about this straight a million right. times. We know it's bad. But just being on the field takes so much defensive attention away. And he also gives Kyler that security blanket. And, you know, Larry Fitzgerald is, is great at that, but he's not as dynamic of a, a security blanket. Mm-hmm. When you're throwing to DeAndre Hopkins on third and five, not only do you think you're going to get the first down, he might house the thing, right? right. So. He's he's that kind of guy who just makes his quarterback look better. And, you know, you look at the guys early in DeAndre Hopkins playing with 
he was still putting up numbers. It, it didn't yeah. matter if it was you know, the Tom Savage or whoever. It just Brock Osweiler Hopkins is just that good. Yeah, he's, it didn't matter who's throwing him the ball. Now he's got a guy. Again, Deshaun's right too, but he's got a guy in Kyler who's I think is going to be really good. I think you think is going to be really sure. good. And now you know you, you've married those two guys together, and they can kind of grow. I, I can't wait to see Arizona. I I was very skeptical skeptical about the Cliff Kingsbury hire. I, I just thought this right. guy can't win at Texas Tech. How's he going to win in the NFL? But uh, you know, hey, I'll, I'll watch. I'll give him a, a shot. And I thought that last year, look, they played. You know, I'm rewatching the NFL games from last season. I like to mm-hmm. do that during the off season. We forget, like week two last year, they went into Baltimore and almost beat them. Like they, if they weren't kicking 18 yard field goals, they might have beat them. They were feisty. Like I think you used that term before. Yeah. I think they're going to be growing, and I think Cliff was the right hire at this moment. I think Kyler's going to be great, and I think DeAndre Hopkins just brings it all together. You just don't fall into guys like that very often. You, you, no. He is well, a come special. On. You don't fall. Look, you don't fall into, into DeAndre Hopkins. DeAndre Hopkins is playing for Bill O'Brien, who's a lunatic. <laughs> it's, right? It's unbelievable, right? I mean, like, let's unpack that. You don't usually get to trade for a player like DeAndre Hopkins because Bill O'Brien's out of control. Right. And I, you know, Sig, when I think about Bill O'Brien, and now I think the jury's in, this trade kind of pushed it over. Years and years I kept saying, is Bill O'Brien good? Because he keeps winning division titles mm-hmm. with uh, whoever. Like, I, name all those quarterbacks in the pre Deshaun era. They were terrible. But he kept winning division titles. So at some point, you got to give him his credit. And he's winning with kind of subpar quarterbacks, uh, Brock Osweiler, whatever. But now it's like, is he just not getting enough out of his guys? Does he not realize that? You know, when you when you sign Randall Cobb and then you say, "Oh, Kenny Stills is on the trade block now," whether he is or not, I'm not sure. But you know, I mean, well, I'd rather Kenny Stills than Randall Cobb right now. So yeah. I'm like what? And nothing. There's no plan. That's the problem I have with the Texans. It's like there's they're just flying by the seat of their pants, and every day changes. Whereas they don't have a, a really uh, any kind of a long term, short term even plan for what they're doing in that organization. Right. So, and what I like that you're saying there, Frank is that it's okay for us sitting from our vantage point to look at the moves, look for something that's internally consistent, something that mm-hmm. indicates some organizational clarity, some kind of plan, and say, it doesn't seem to be apparent. We don't just need to defer to the experts, to the GMs. Sometimes it really is incoherent. Like some people might look at what's going on in Chicago right now and have some opinions about that. But <laughs> I was just going to say, if, if we can't if we can't question GMs, then I guess Mitch Trubisky is better than Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> we, we all hated that pick at the time. Right, but, right. By the way, Cla- you said clarity. I don't have a drink next. Uh, I can't play the drinking game. Now. I know, and I, I have to. Should I have, should be saying Frank Schwab. Uh, I'm thinking of that. Um, so Bill O'Brien, that's interesting. And in, in Frank, in the comic book super villain storyline, like Bill O'Brien with this DeAndre Hopkins move, like last year with the Laramie Tunsil trade, and you know it, we'll see what how history treats that. But that at least had some coherence. Um, but the DeAndre Hopkins trade, and Hopkins himself came out and said, "I knew if I was asked for a raise, I would get." my way out. And so I asked for a raise. And so I got what I wanted. Um, and here's the thing. So, uh, yeah. Let me cut you off real quick, just because I have to make this point because I've made it a bunch of times. Obviously the Texans leaked to, I think it was Diana Rossini that DeAndre Hopkins was asking for 18 to 20 million. And I think that they thought everybody's going to think he's greedy and the, the right. tide is going right. to turn it. And everybody mm-hmm. kind of said, yeah, 18 to 20 million. Yeah. That that's what he should be paid. That's not even what Michael Thomas is getting now. What's the right. Houston, Texas problem. So sick. They can't even leak. No. Bad information, uh, like damaging information correctly. That's how it, bad that organization It shows how out of touch O'Brien is. It shows exactly. that he's exactly. he's out of touch. And in a player's league, he's out of touch because Hopkins just said what everybody knew, which is that you can get your, you can, now John, Deshaun yep. Watson may not have it in him to be this guy that decides to grab hold of his destiny instead of just being loyal to his organization. But DeAndre Hopkins, like the league knows, you can, you can talk your way out of Houston. And in comic book supervillain terms um o'brien is now uh gm officially there's the whole rick smith story that one's sad Oof. look that up um and and i think it was aaron reese of the athletic that said that basically now he's going to get three years to do his program like the, like this the ownership has to give him like okay so like now he's like the supervillain has completely Complete power, and that DeAndre Hopkins move was the moment that the you know the straw that broke the camel's back, or whatever mixed metaphor you want to use. That <laughs> O'Brien, it's like it's like what happens if you give someone Bill Belichick power, but they don't know how to wisely right. use it. Um, 
and a couple other things when you talked about Arizona that come up. Um, I just one of the things about DeAndre Hopkins that's so exciting is that maybe Cliff can really run something truer to what he was conceiving of, conceiving of in his offense. You know, they threw a bunch of darts with those picks last year, Isabella and and Butler and Johnson. None of them really played significant roles. Larry Fitzgerald can only do so much. Christian Kirk was banged up, but now you add DeAndre Hopkins and Kenyon Drake. That's what that can one, do. Yeah. This could be a fun offense. They've done a little bit to firm up the offensive line. Another thing that's exciting is the linebackers. They add Simmons. They uh, signed Campbell and Hicks. So that's a. I mean, they had Hicks from last year. They signed Vaughn Kennard. Uh, they Patrick Peterson's not going to be suspended now. Um, that's exciting. Um, and uh, um, and Arizona. Think, let let me I, ask you something, Sig, because I because yeah. maybe I'm overreacting. I, I okay. wrote about this and kind of ripped the Cardinals for saying. He's good. Simmons is going to stay in one spot. I, yeah. I, I look at that as why draft him then? Like, if you mm. don't want to use his full capabilities, of, right. uh, this kid lined the, the most snaps he had last year, I think was a cornerback. Like, that's how athletic he yeah, is. Yeah. He is a freak show. And to just say he is going to be an inside linebacker, there's where he's going to be. He's going to be static. Am I overreacting to say no, I, to say that that's a bad idea? There's a mixed message just coming from the organization, I think. Uh, there are. That's true. And, and I think that what how I read that, and I'm reading it like this, is that you start out with him in, in one room, one meeting, uh, one position, and then and the thing is because they have a linebacker, um, again they have five linebackers to get on the field, yeah. so they can do some things. But you have him in a home role. But I do think that you're going to see him be he's a player like. Um, like uh, Troy Palmalu, or again, we're going to compare him to safeties. Um, uh, Matthew, uh, you know, formerly of yeah. the Cardinals. Derwin, you I, wanna... I, Derwin might be my favorite guy. Derwin James. I love Derwin James. But yeah. I think what these guys all have in common is you want to let them in some way create their own structure around them as they process the field and tap into their incredible physical talents as opposed to having a set role. You know, think of it like like a, like a the old games, like a foosball table or something where, where the movement's very limited within a certain role. If there's like slots and routes on the field where you like areas you fit in, you want Simmons to be able to be more instinctive, I think, and they they may have the guys to do that. So it's anywhere from one to five positions, depending on who you ask. But we'll see because in previous regimes, like James Becker, they loved these. Like Hassan Reddick was supposed to be that guy, right? He can rush the passer. He can drop into coverage. He can do all these things. And oh, Reddick isn't even getting that. his yeah. fifth year option. So uh, we'll see. Vance Joseph, you know Vance Joseph, man. I mean, we'll, we'll see what he can do yeah. with him. The other thing that I wanted to mention though, because and I, 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 I kind of think it's yeah, I think it's kind of a, a little bit of a smokescreen, a little bit of a why are we going to tell people we're going to move Isaiah Simmons around? They'll see it on week one. I, I yeah. hope so because I think so. I want to see. I want to see him play the Derwin role. I want to see him. Yeah, hey, we're going to line him up. Outside linebacker, safety, corner, inside linebacker, right. just roamer. Uh, it'd just be a exactly. robber, basically. And so right. I, I just want right. to get all. I want to get yeah, all. I, I think that you what you ideally want to do is have him line up somewhere in the formation that when the quarterback is surveying things pre-snap, he doesn't know if he's going to rush. He doesn't know if he's going to drop into coverage. And make and him to, react. Or make him react to the defense instead of the defense reacting to the offense. Right. Right. Absolutely. It's it's going to be fun. But I just wanted to mention too that like you mentioned about Arizona playing Baltimore tough, they took San Francisco to the brink yeah. in both games. Both games. They matched up very well with San Francisco in last year's version. So that's exciting. Okay. It's exciting, man. It's good. I love it. I love the enthusiasm. Cause I mean, I, I knew it was, and we've talked and hung out before and it's just that spark and that enthusiasm. But I want to ask you, cause we're not going to delve into much fantasy. Although I know, Hank, hey, bring it on. Yeah, wow, yeah, wow. I know. You play, and you look, and, 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 and you're, and I know you're a friend of fantasy football for sure. Um, oh, I love it. But I wanted to ask you this, just as like, how do you decide what you're going to do with your, your beat at Yahoo? Cause you're, you're the NFL beat, not a specific team. And mm -hmm. it seems like you kind of write about what you want to write about. Yeah, absolutely. It's, that's why I love this job. I really do because the canvas is, it's pretty wide. I mean, it's, I could be writing about uh, God knows what. I, if, if uh, Vernon Davis shows up on like a TV show, cause he's trying to be an actor now. I write about that. Mm -hmm. I write about X's and O's tomorrow. I could write about it's It's just every day is different. Every day is crazier. Dr writing about Deandre Baker. My goodness. I didn't think oh, I'd be man. writing, a, writing the terms, uh, you know, uh, illegal high stake uh, dice game. Uh, I didn't think I'd be writing about that. So it's just whatever people want, man, where I look at it as I, I love, Every part of the NFL. Well, yeah, let, I, should, I don't love every part of the NFL. I don't love writing about crime. I really don't. I don't love writing about the least foibles. I, I don't love right. that stuff. But 
you you and I are the same kind of same way. We're just we just love the entire game of football, the personalities, the strategy, the teams, the draft, the X's and O's, the everything. Love it. Yeah. And so it's it's a perfect job for me, man. I can I, I can write about whatever people are going to read about. I'll write about, it. and it, it's so much fun doing it. Yeah, it's the best um, reality show. By the way, you see that Vontae oh. and Vernon's cousin uh, is an undrafted free agent for the Chiefs, Javaris. Davis, cornerback out of... So we got another Davis. The good yeah. bloodlines, man. Uh, <laughs> good bloodlines there. Um, nope. But yeah, it's... it's it, The NFL is our favorite reality show. And like you said, some of it gets dark. Um, but we're seeing it during coronavirus times. I mean, it is the stopper in the bathtub of our collective mental health, right? Because there's so much investment Absolutely. in the idea that like there has to be NFL. I mean, there are... MLB and, and other sports play that role for some people, for sure. Mm -hmm. But but the hold the NFL has on a collective consciousness is just it gets deeper and deeper every year. And we grew up when when it was like maybe even greater. I mean, in a, in a time when there was a monoculture, like everybody was watching the same shows and listening to the same music. And doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. NFL was still not in the same way. I think that it reigns over MLB and NBA in terms of numbers, but just the the, the size of the stage. Yeah. I mean, baseball, uh, Monday can... Night Football back in the day. That's why right. these games, right. some of those games are so famous because Joe Theismann's leg breaking is so famous because everybody was watching. Right, the fridge game. scoring a touchdown. Yeah, you know, exactly. everybody right. can remember that when there was around watching the league at that time in NFL films. Um, and it, it's epic in scope. Uh, and what I love about it the most, what gets me the most excited, Frank is that each thing that happens is another sentence in a grand novel of a team, of a player, of a coach, mm -hmm. of, a, mm -hmm. of, of, a, of a story about like football strategy and schemes and the, and the ebb and flow of trends in the game and how players and it intersect with all the stories. Actually, The Last Dance, I think, did a tremendous job. The um, broken timeline narration where it's almost like hypertext, like, oh, while we're on the subject of Steve Kerr, let's go down to the Steve <laughs> Kerr story, you right. know? Mm -hmm. And the NFL oh, is like that. Job. So you can think of all these stories as intertwined, interconnected, um, affecting each other in this interrelated way. And then we have this pause right now. And, you know, normally we'd have some OTAs and rookie mini camps and stuff to process, but still it's a pause anyway, the normal calendar. And we can ponder wow, the, all the next chapter, like just when we wait for the new season of a TV show, you know, what's going to happen with these characters? How is this storyline that was left over from last year going to resolve itself? You mentioned Absolutely. Tampa, just in general. And I love the, like, I don't know, is, is there a term like not for numerologists, but people that look at letters and words? I have a story to tell about that, about Mardi Gras and excesses and I'd like to hear your Mardi Gras stories. Uh, I would. I think we need to do that. Different after. people have heard that story a different time. It involves a bail bondsman, a lawyer, uh -huh. finding a lawyer who worked out of the trunk of his car, and lots of other things. Don't don't pee outside if you come down here for Mardi Gras. Um, but letters, right? Um, like numerology, both letters, because Tampa Bay, Tom Brady, like it was meant to be, right? TB12 and all this stuff. Are you buying it? I mean, t Tampa's Super Bowl favorite, top five Super Bowl, et cetera, et cetera. Are you buying it? No, I, I'm not. Mm. I, I, I just look, I feel like last year, especially late in the year, we were talking about how Tom Brady was taking a step back, right? Like everybody seemed to agree. This isn't the same Tom Brady's declining. And then as soon as the off season hit, it was well, what franchise is Tom Brady going to save? I was like, wait, were we just talking about him being maybe not washed up, but a decline. Yeah. I look at the way and we're talking about micro and getting into the macro, the mm -hmm. micro, the way the Tennessee Titans, who have Mike Vrabel, who loves Tom Brady's former teammate, the way the Tennessee Titans approached that game was, we've scored enough points. We don't think you're going to score. It was 14-13 for most of mm -hmm. We don't think you're going to score another another point. And uh, uh, prime Tom Brady, especially Mike Vrabel, who knows him so well, never gives him that shot. Never punts from the from the New England side of the field. I mean, it's it, so I think that when you're looking at the clues of Bill Belichick didn't seem to want Brady back. There was no movement, right? Like the greatest coach ever, no. who's won six Super Bowls with Tom Brady, didn't try to get him back. Mike Vrabel, his teammate, a very good coach, I think, he coached that wild card game like, we're not scared of you, Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. And so I look also at the history of 43-year-old quarterbacks. I don't know if you've looked this up. There's only mm -hmm. one guy who has started right. multiple games games at 43 or older and it's Vinny Testaverde and he was terrible like it was there's literally no history of this 
And I also read some of the things like Jason Lick talking about, oh, we think Tom Brady's arm is perfect for Bruce Arians' offense. I, I, there's no stats that back that up. There's no all 22 that really backs that up. Now, this guy's very smart. Bruce Arians is a great coach. Maybe they're seeing things. Things that, that me and you can't see because they're, they're experts at this field. But I just look at it as I think it's a bad fit. Uh... Oh, I think I lost Frank. Folks, can you still hear me? Or did Frank lose me? Okay, well, while we wait for Frank, everybody, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody in the chat room. Um, I was, he was talking about uh, Tom Brady. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Diego. Um, I will say we will pick up that conversation when and if Frank comes back. And those of you that are with us, let's just try something fun and new. Uh, what questions, what is on your mind, chat room, as, a, as you were kind enough to join us? And Frank will be right back now wait and uh you know i think that uh, one of the things that frank was talking about with tom brady why wait to see if anybody has any questions in the chat room um is it really the age issue sets up perfectly matthew riley says do you like chris godwin and this uh ties into um tom brady and i will say that i'm a little skeptical about chris godwin in the second round of fantasy drafts because we don't know how much his the value of Julian Edelman in the slot was based on the option route, the finishing each other's sentences relationship between Brady and Edelman and whether Brady and Godwin can develop that. Although there's a lot of evidence about Bruce Arians and the Godwin uh, slot effect, although I, you also have Rob Gronkowski, you also have Mike Evans. The thing that mainly concerns me about Chris Godwin is that I think a decent amount of his excess production last year came in games that got a little wild and wooly. And in the second half, whenever the Buccaneers were down, Winston was throwing a lot. I just think this is going to be a closer to the best team. I think it's going to be a more balanced offense. The defense is going to continue to improve. Uh, it goes back to the first two games of the season. And, I think that uh, in those games you saw against San Francisco um, that the, and against uh, the Carolina, the, team, the game whenever Cam Newton was the last time we saw him, there was a more of a keep Jameis Winston making low-risk throws, a more balanced offense, and I think they're going to be able to do that with Tom Brady. So Chris Godwin in the second round. Second round, I'm more of a maybe Lamar Jackson or Patrick Mahomes, depending on our scoring system. Or Travis Kelsey or George Kittle, uh, I think that's a good round because the second round of the sixth round is going to be about the same at wide receiver. It's very level. Running back is going to be a tougher uh, road to hoe, but you'll see the drop off from first round running backs to second round running backs is pretty rough, and from second round running backs to third round running backs is rough. So you're throwing darts anyway. Take your one number one running back and then hope for uh, something to hit later. Um, so you know, two oh nine. I'm probably not going to be taking. Chris Godwin. Uh, I also saw um, Contrasound asked, what do we think about Fournette? And uh, Fournette, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties, so this might be flying solo. Um, hmm. I'm going to go ahead, folks, and see if I can resume this. Uh, let me finish up with Fournette here from Contrasound. Um, I'm not going near Fournette. I think you can get him at the third in the third round. You can look at his usage. You can look at his. Um, you can look at his his receptions. I just don't know if that's going to happen again. You have Chris Thompson. We'll see if Chris Thompson is going to be uh, somebody that can stay on the field. We know that he, Jay Gruden knows how to use him in the passing game. But even uh, aside from that, you have someone where the organization has already signaled that they're going forward without this player. Now, I don't know how we can create a data set with this. Uh, I'm not sure how, especially fifth-year option is, you know, new advent in 
contract structure just recently, you know, last CBA. But when a team signals that they know, you know, Devontae Parker, I, I think being a, an interesting counterbalance here, um, where Devontae Parker did come through in that fifth year, but it was a new regime. I think the new regime here is that Tom Coughlin, who was the guy who went after Fournette, was a Coughlin pick, isn't there. And the team has already signaled that they don't want to go forward with Fournette as their starter after this year at the price he's going to cost in free agency. Alternatively, you also have an organization, if you want me to make you feel better about taking Fournette in the third round, you have an organization that was asking a second-day pick uh, they were expecting to trade him on the second day, which I think shows how much they overvalued him. So maybe they still see him as a decent running back, but I think you can see that while he's a competent NFL starting running back, he might not be that much more than that. Uh, and it's going to see a similar fall in value to, say, Jordan Howard. And I, I just don't want part of that. But I do want part of Frank Schwab. You're back, Frank. You know, technology, man. Anyway, so with Brady... I just don't love the fit, and I hate betting against the all-time greats. Uh, it's it's kind of trite, but Tom Brady's beat all the rules already. Like, uh, you know, he, he's already the greatest forty-one-year-old quarterback ever. He's the greatest forty-two-year-old quarterback. Who's to say he can't be the greatest forty-three-year-old quarterback right. ever? But I, I just don't know. I I worry that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to sit there in mid-October and say, "Boy, we're we're stuck with this guy two years. What are we yeah. going to do?" Yeah, well, look, I was saying while you, while you went off into the, the ether, out into the void, <laughs> um, that uh, and someone asked me about Chris Godwin in the chat room. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I said, I do think you can go back to the first two games of last year with Tampa Bay, and you saw an offense where it was more balanced. They were having James Winston make more low-risk throws, and the defense was playing well. Remember, Todd Bowles revived that defense, yes. and they brought back all the important pieces, right? They bring back Pierre mm -hmm. Paul. They bring back Shaq Barrett. You know, um, they've got a young developing secondary there. They've got Vea and Sue. They're going to be, forget about it. You can't run on them, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, um, which at least is going to give them. That. And look, even if their pass defense is not the strongest facet of their defense, that you can make offense predictable is helpful. Uh, and I think you're going to see a team that's going to play more close to the vest and have more lower scoring game scripts. And you're going to ask Tom Brady to protect the ball more than you're going to ask him to no risk it, no biscuit. Right. Um, so for fantasy... But that's, but that's not Arian's offense, man. That's, well, I know. That's not his and, mindset either. And Clyde it's, Christensen it's said, it's... I know, I know, and Clyde Christensen said, so I don't know if you saw this, Frank, but Clyde Christensen said that Peyton, and I'm sure you know this, Peyton said, "I'm if I'm going somewhere, I'm taking my offense and my verbiage and everything with me. So if you want me, that's what you're getting. Brady didn't do that. Brady said, uh, well, what do you want me to do? Brady came in and said, well, what, what, what do you want me to do here? And uh, Craig Christensen said it's going to be Arians' offense with Brady influence. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I look, Bruce Arians is a really smart guy, and he's not going to have Tom Brady throwing uh, the 40 yard uh, goal routes to Mike Evans all game. Like, that's not yeah. his strength no. anymore. It's, it's just not. And I think they will figure that part out of it, uh, a part out, but. I don't know. It's just, it's some, look, I love Brady. I'm not one yeah. of these Brady haters. I'm not one of these guys. Brady's the greatest quarterback of all time. But at some ah. point when you look, he is, he is, man. He is, he is. The okay. resume, so, resume wise, totally, he is. What's funny about that is I had like some New England trolls like mm -hmm. surrounding us came into our chat room for a couple of weeks. It was like the bad old days on blog talk radio or something <laughs> because I said, cause everyone's saying Brady's the greatest. And I mean, I guess he's the winningness or most successful, but I think if you were starting a team from scratch, Right, right. It's a tough. You out. might not pick Tom Brady as your quarterback, and we'll see. It, and that's what's so great about this season. It's a referendum on Brady versus Belichick. It's a, it's a referendum. See, I on don't like, think so, Sig. I, I, I don't think that you can take a forty-three-year-old Brady and let's say he has no. Let's say he falls off the planet, like right. most forty-three-year-olds do. I don't think you could say, "Oh, look, he was all Belichick." And I don't think if you take Bill Belichick, if Jared Stidham just stinks, if that's yeah. their plan. I don't think you could look at that and say Bill Belichick was a fraud. He went Tom no. Brady. I, no, I just no, think no, that no, it's, no, no. but people are going to make it out to be that. You know sure, how it is today I get it. on I get Twitter it. and uh, you know, everybody wants to jump uh, to these conclusions. It's true. I think that these guys, it's, it's, to me, it's not one or the other. And that, it, that argument bothers me, to be honest. It was a Brady as a Belichick. It just, it's the perfect marriage. It is yeah, the greatest coach true. of all time. With Whether we want to say he's the greatest quarterback, he has the greatest resume of all time. I think yeah. we'd agree with that. I mean, he's, the skin's on the wall, as John Fox likes yeah. to say. Tom Brady has more of them than anybody. So I don't look at that as – I just think that it's uh, it just two guys that are kind of playing out the string. Now, if 
Brady wins the Super Bowl, Tampa Bay. Yeah, that that obviously then that starts changes right, the math, and that's but... and that's the transformative effect. And again, the idea right. of these transformative figures. You bring Tom Brady into the building, and everybody just looks at themselves differently, does their job differently. Mm-hmm. I love the Ryan. Jen- you saw the Ryan Jensen story, right? And this is something he's done. So Tom Brady, I wrote about this today. Tom Brady takes Ryan Jensen or having this secret workout or whatever. And he tells Ryan Jensen, "Here's how you fold your towel and you put talcum powder, baby powder on it." And that way your ass isn't going to sweat anymore. Yeah. And it's like, this is, to me, this is a very micro thing that becomes macro. Tom Brady is going to instill this culture of the yeah. details matter. Everything matters. Sure. How you fold your towel is yeah. going to make sure this football is not wet. That's what Tom Brady brings intrinsically to the Buccaneers that you just can't get out of a, a young guy, James Winston, anybody. Right. It, it, it sets the tone. I've always said, Frank, t- teams take on the personality of their head coach and their quarterback. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly that represents a big change. And look, even the way you've defined it, and look, I, I'm sorry if I was hot takey about it's a referendum on Brady or Belichick. No, but no, is, no, 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 no. It's, it's meaningful it's... that it's the first data point for each of them without right. each other, and we'll right. see how it plays out. And we watch it, and again, the the what, the does, what's the record, or do they win the Super Bowl, or do they make the playoffs, isn't as important as the, how it goes down. And what's watching it in real time. And the way you said it, Brady with the 43-year-old quarterback thing is perfect, because, you know, you, he, he wants to do the whole TB12 brand. And I, you want to know how I was able to play, be the only, see, uh, you could be like the, they could quote you right there. The only quarterback at age 43 to play well, it's, you know, buy my TB12, whatever. And that's what this is all setting up for. Um, <laughs> it, you know, we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Okay. So on the flip side of that, what do you see in the crystal ball for New England? Because the reality is, I was saying this on a show like last week or the week before, New England's offense was bad last year. Bad. Like, really like well, if you watch the Steelers offense, well, at least they didn't have Roethlisberger. You know what I mean? Like, okay, mm-hmm. um, you can make some excuses for New England, but it was it was a futile offense, mm-hmm. and sometimes even a first down seemed like a Herculean task for them. Um, and that's why, as you were commenting on Mike Vrabel saying, like, I'm not afraid of this defense. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not afraid of this offense. Mm-hmm. So now you you go to Jared Stidham, and you know, the defense and special teams might still scrap and win some games for them, but this looks pretty bleak to me, man. I, and uh, I just don't know. I, I I can't look the whole, like they're tanking for Trevor. Like, no, they're not no. going to be the worst team in the NFL. Like you hear this a lot though, not from you, but uh, you know, you hear this a lot. I don't think they're going to be that bad, but I, I think the bills are the favorite in the AFC East, right? Yeah. Like I, I this is their moment. weird to say it out loud. Yes. No, no, exactly. but they, I mean, they have to be preparing like set, settling of, Nothing short of at least making the. What's the problem? Is you got Baltimore and Kansas City. At least winning a playoff game. <laughs> let's be. Let's set I think attainable just, goals. I honestly just think winning the AFC East because the Patriots yeah. have just dominated that division so long. Even if they go one and done, which wouldn't be ideal, especially after they blew the game last year. Even if the Bills go one and done, but they've won the East, they've slayed the Dragon, they've they've knocked off the Tampa or the New England Patriots finally. I think that that'd be a successful year for them, and they could feel very good about that. Yeah. Let's put it this way: if I was a Bills fan and they won the AFC East this year, I'd be wearing an AFC East champs 2020 shirt and be very, very proud of it because yeah. it will be an accomplishment to 11 in a row for the Patriots. This is right. an unbelievable streak, and I think yes, this is their time. I, I just think everything's set up for them. I, th- I like the Diggs move. I know they mm-hmm. overpaid for it, but hey, it's hard to get those guys. It's right. You drive Justin Jefferson, that's great. You don't know what he's going to be. I know mm-hmm. what Stephon Diggs is, and he's a really, really good player. I, I think Josh Allen's improving. I think the running game's going to be fine with Moss and Singletary. It's just everything does line up for them. The Patriots are interesting in that I don't think they fall off the planet. I just – I need to see Bill Belichick stink before I believe it. Sure. Well, they'll be a tough out. I mean, Bill Belichick's right. still, still going to play the meta game of like, okay, uh, I'm going to th- – frustrate you you know i i'm i almost feel like bill belichick what he one of the things he does so well is psychoanalyze other coach or the team and understand how to take them out of their comfort zone and um win by dictating the terms of engagement and Uh, and i think we you know we talk about a lot about coronavirus right i do think mm -hmm. bill belichick looked at this offseason and made a calculated decision of if I bring well, in quarterbacks, yeah, yeah. If Cam I bring Newton. in Andy Dalton, if I bring yeah. in, Cam, I'm not going to have an off season with them. At least Jared right. knows the knows the program. He's been right. in it here. What do you think of Jared Stidham? I, I'll ask you because I don't really have an opinion. I I'm up and down on him. I think it's an unknown, right? It it's really an unknown because so so you can look at his 20, um, eight, 2017, and yep. at, after that he's a first round quarterback. And mm-hmm. wow, let's see what this guy's having future. You look at his 2018 and. 
you can say, well, whatever, he's a fourth round pick. I mean, in the NFL, if you're not a quarterback taking the first two rounds, it means that nobody thinks you're going to be a starter. No, um, absolutely. And there are I a lot mean, of wasted think, picks after a second round. A lot yeah, of, you're, well, you're, the just, first Steelers have made a few of them. Yeah. Oh, geez, don't <laughs> even get me started on that. Um, so, you know, I think you're going to see Josh McDaniels make a lot of structure around him. And again, just like last year, how they won games, it's going to be defense, it's going to be special teams. And, you know, it's going to be Bill Belichick dialing up or Josh McDaniels dialing up that one play at the right time and Stidham executing. But there's a wide range for Stidham because it's, do you think that 2018 exposed inherent flaws or was it just there's a bunch of things working against him at Auburn? But I think you're absolutely right. And this gives me a good jumping off point to a larger topic of um, how this season's going to be different. How, well, wait, let me, before I do that, so let that simmer on the back burner. I want to say this. If I was Frank Schwab and I could just write about what I wanted to write about, you mentioned the Stefan <laughs> Diggs move. Uh-huh. Um, what the Stefan Diggs move represents is, like you said, you could draft Justin Jefferson, but what are you going to get this year? What are you going to get next year? Um, it's He's a lot cheaper than Stefan Diggs, but M- Buffalo had a lot of cap room. You know, Sean McDermott got to do his program, and, you know, we're at the tail end of it. And you have a team acting very aggressively in the rookie quarterback salary window. And I think t- teams have absorbed, and you know, Chicago did it when they traded for Cleo Mack. Teams have absorbed the idea that when you have a starting quarterback on his rookie contract, you push your chips in. Just like the guy who won the Madden mm-hmm. championship with Trey Tress Ways quarterback. You saw you <laughs> right. saw that, that right? Was, yeah, sure. But yeah. using the using the, the the you know, it's using the salary cap uh arbitrage there. If you have a punter as your quarterback, you can spend big on other positions. Mm-hmm. Likewise. So I like what uh I like the Buffalo is acknowledging and um in, t- taking like internalizing the idea that we should go for it right now while Josh Allen's on a rookie contract. And then what I would do if I was someone like Frank Schwab that could just say, I'm going to spend time writing something I want to write is something like a ranking of the teams that had windows with um, rookie quarterback contracts and how well they did with that. Like in just detailing like who blew it, you know, whose ship went into the iceberg, who came this close. Um, You know, obviously Kansas city is out there in front right now with what, let let me ask you something. Cause you like talking about the game in a big picture way. Yeah. We both agree. The most valuable thing in sports, and we're all we're, we both like other sports, so we can say this: the most valuable thing in sports is having a good rookie quarterback on his rookie deal, right? Or good, oh, good yeah. quarterback. On- it's a cheat code. So why hasn't any team used this as a strategy? And I thought about the Rams, and I wrote about this in my season preview of the Rams a couple of years ago, maybe it was last year. That instead of paying Jared Goff, right? Why don't you say the reason Jared Goff is who he is is because of Sean McVay? Right. We are going to. Trade Jared Goff for two first round picks. Let's just say two. I don't know. Sure. Could be three. Could be more. I don't know. Let's, we're going to trade Jared Goff for two first round picks. We're going to take a, a first round quarterback with one of those picks, and he's going to become the next Jared Goff. And we're going to have ninety five percent of our cap still available for the rest of the roster. Why hasn't and it, why are teams so scared to do that? Uh, Jared Goff. We look at now, and that contract's not good. He's not a special guy. I don't think. Right. And maybe right. He just had a bad year. Is maybe, any team, can you see any team? Maybe it's, that's what Bill Belichick is doing. Maybe it is. And, and he'd be the guy, right? He's got right? endless job security. He's yep. he's fully confident in his abilities to develop and Josh McDaniel's ability to develop a quarterback. I just, it, it just frustrates me. I thought the Seahawks might do it with Russ. Now mm-hmm. it turns out, you know, Russ is. Do you buy the stuff about him being on the trade block two years ago? I don't know. I, they, they treat that guy so weirdly that. And hey, look. So you're open to at least that it's possible. At least it's possible. I, yeah, because when you look at how they've they've kind of built their current team with Schottenheimer, with Pete being, we're just going to run the ball and play defense. Right, right. As I wrote in my preview a couple of years ago, the Seattle Seahawks should wake up every day, and the first thing they should do is thank God they got Russell Wilson. Right? right. Like teams go decades. The Chicago Bears have not had a first team All Pro quarterback since 1950. Mm-hmm. Jo- Johnny Lujan, 1950. Teams go 70 years trying to get a Russell Wilson. They get Russell Wilson and they say, we're bringing in shoddy and we're going to run the ball. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. But th- they have success because Pete's really good. He's, he's good at a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so when you say, like, is it possible they could trade Russell Wilson? The way they've kind of treated their team construction, maybe. I, right, I guess right. they don't seem like they don't seem like they value him like they should. Like, right. I think that, you know, the Seattle Seahawks should be like, this was the greatest thing that's ever happened to our franchise, legit, legitimately. Like, they won a Super Bowl with the guy. 
And they just kind of seem like, ah, well, we're going to give the ball to Rashad Penny and Chris Carson. Like, ah, well, I, I'm, yeah. I'm riding Russ. And not just because, uh, you know, not just because I'm representing Wisconsin, sure. but, no but doubt. He's, he's just been a special guy. And so when you think about will the Seahawks trade Russ, I, I can't rule it out because they just seem very oddly a little lukewarm with him. Yeah, just, which no is what the way they, they build the team. No doubt. And, and, and you, do you see the stuff that floated out there about like, he was on the block for the number one pick two years ago. Right. They, they called are. Cleveland. It, I mean, look, I can say that I've definitely been privy to talk over the last few years that he is not as secure as the starting quarterback as you think he should be mm-hmm. in Seattle for different reasons, different stories, depending on who you hear it from. Sure. Um, but no doubt, I mean, this is another one where we can say, like, look, we can make judgments from the outside looking in. Russell Wilson's really, really good. So you would assume that as you construct the terms of engagement in a game, you would want your offensive game plan to make him as important as possible <laughs> right. because he's yeah, really, yeah. really good. And he's a guy uh, who scored 37 of their 38 touchdowns. What right. was that three years ago? Uh, right. Most unbelievable stat I've seen in my And unbelievably durable, too. It is yes, the nano bubbles, yes. right? Um, so Let that's me ask one you a question. Things. This was a great yeah. question somebody brought up to me. Let's say we're in a, 11 months down the road. Jacksonville Jaguars have the number one pick. The Seattle Seahawks say we'll trade Russell Wilson right. for the number one pick of Trevor Lawrence. Who says no? I mean, it just it depends on the owner, but that's like an absentee owner, so who knows? Yeah, they, like maybe I, they could put I mean, it up could, to like, like a, a poll on Twitter for the fans of the team. That'd be and they great. I, I don't think he trade Trevor Lawrence, right? Because he's this Uber prospect. He's Andrew Luck and right. John Elway and all these Uber, but he's Russell Wilson. He's a Hall of Famer. He's only going to be thirty two, I think, next year. Right. And five years in the NFL is an eternity. I, I laugh when I, you know, teams go. Oh, we want a 15 year option at quarterback, or we want a guy for the next 12 years. You don't have 12 years. <laughs> right. You got three if you're lucky. So don't don't be thinking about second contract. But I thought that was, it was an interesting question. And I do think, you know, teams who have that, that star quarterback, they really need to, to value him more than Seahawks do anyway. Yeah. But they do keep away. But I just think some team is going to leverage the whole rookie quarterback or quarterbacks mm-hmm. on the rookie deal, our most valuable thing. And we're just going to keep cycling this thing. And we're not going to pay Jared Goff 140 million just because it just team construction wise it never works. Yeah, I think that the when the the path to that Frank is a highly structured offense. You know, whatever we've seen uh-huh. it, like Mike Leach's air raid or Cliff Kingsbury, whoever. And now Kingsbury's interesting case because he got the ideal quarterback to like the team, the quarterback that he's right. always wanted to activate everything in the system. But if you have a highly structured system. And you look for certain traits that maybe, you know, the NFL wants an ideal quarterback, but you can make the system work with a quarterback who checks like these three boxes. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, you keep cycling through. It's going to be fascinating to watch because as the gap between the low salary and the big salary gets wider and wider, you know, when it's become 40 million a year, Mm -hmm. 50 million a year, 60 million a year, and the the backups are still making like 5 million or 7 million, there's going to be a bigger incentive to give it a go. Um, so, uh, so going back to what I was going to say, um, and Frank, I think if we were going to talk about all 32 teams, we would need like six hours. No, hey, just, I, I, let me look at I got nothing we to like do. To, I know, right? I know, I one, of these, <laughs> one of these days, one of these days for sure. But how do you think this season's going to be different? And it's obviously oh, going to yeah. be different. Mm-hmm. How, like, w- when you envision the season, what's what's different? You know, could be like, how is it like fans? People are asking me, like, are we going to project games the same way if there's no right. crowd and so on? Anyway. I, there's so many moving parts. This I think the first part is we have to give extra credit to teams with continuity, and that's another reason I'm kind of low on the bucks. The New Orleans Saints bring back, I believe, oh, I yeah. just looked this up. I believe they bring back 19 starters. Um, the Kansas City Chiefs bring back 21, I believe. So teams like that that are that have this continuity, I think get extra credit. I think you have to say if you haven't practiced all off season, that this has to matter. And I think it was. Uh, Maybe McDermott, who brought up the point of it's the passing game that's really going to be uh, a struggle eh? because yeah. you 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 install your passing game in OTAs. That made total sense to me. So do we give more credit to, to running teams? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Do we give more credit to uh, now, uh, you know, uh, our offensive team's going to blow up? Is Patrick Mahomes doesn't have to go on the road for eight road games. Now he's kind of a an alien, right? Like he's just great. Right. He can play he, his actually his road splits are better than his home splits. But any Ben Roethlisberger, you know mm-hmm. the whole story of sure. Ben home and Ben on the road. Well, when you eliminate the crowd, uh, are you also eliminating all the home field advantage? I, I think it ev- evaporates a lot of it. So now we're looking at our quarterbacks like Ben going to throw for 
5,200 yards because they're not having any road games, you know, so to speak. I don't know. I don't know the answer to these questions. I, I think it's going to be interesting. I, I, I think what we – let's just say from a viewer standpoint now, we're watching these games. We're not going to hear the crowd. It's going to be really weird. But we're going to now hear line calls, right? We're going to hear right. some trash talk. Trash talk. talk. We're gonna, like, we're, like the UFC, you know, I, I think it was Greg Hardy of all people – was saying like he could hear the other corner right. and he used some of the stuff to beat the guy. Like we're going to see that. Like I thought about this Sig. can offenses get in a huddle and call plays like normal because the linebackers right. are going to be able to hear it. They're only seven yards away. Eight yards right. away whatever it is. All these things. And I think the smart coaches, the Bill Belichick's of the world have already thought this through. They've thought, okay, this is what we're going to have to do with our, our signals. This is what we're going to have to do with our everything. I think that they've thought this through. I, I think it's fascinating. You know, it's unlike, anything we've seen before much less getting into the whole what happens if tom brady contracts corona yep, yep. Uh, i mean i don't know this is so crazy of a season i think that as far as things like projecting as far as things like you know we do like uh, us like fantasy or us mm -hmm. making over under win total bets or whatever i think we just got to play it straight because we don't know the variables we don't know if let's say california if gavin newsom changes his mind it says no pro sports here uh, okay, what you gonna send the 49ers on the road for 16 games? Right. Like, what wh what do you do with the 49ers? Then do you drop all of your shares at Debo Samuel because he's not gonna play any home games? I, I just don't know, and I think mm -hmm. it's so confusing and so complicated that we can't possibly have a, a, a great answer to any of this. Yeah, it's great. Like layers of complexity that uh, are so difficult many. to project. Um, so, and you know, the players themselves may even learn depending on the scene. Like, uh, getting like. Do you play the same way without the adrenaline? It's a home or road crowd, you know. Yeah. I'm still concerned, Frank. Like, is our player? Are some players going to like let themselves go a little more this off season than they typically oh, would? Uh, is there going to be a, a factor like an internal discipline kind of factor where? Uh, and I forget who was it said on my show uh, a couple weeks or months ago when I asked the similar question um, that the first month of the season is going to really look like the preseason this year and, and it always might, does uh, you've talked about that yeah and, and, and but we're really going to see like october november we may see some changes uh it's going to be fascinating but again as we uh, the undertone always is like may there be a season right and yeah. and and, we and i you know what i think the one the one comp we have is 2011 right I, right I mean, the guys were locked out I, I don't remember everybody being out of shape and i do remember cam newton having a great rookie year so maybe right. that maybe we're overreacting because it was a, a big passing of, year that was matthew stafford's big year Oh yeah, 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 that's right. Put his house on the market. That's something to write about. Yeah, right. Uh, the Matthew Stafford's so interesting, right? Like he mm -hmm. was on a career pace last year before he got hurt. I hope he can stay healthy. That whole NFC North. I just did division previews for our videos, and it was, yeah. the NFC North is like you could you could talk to me tomorrow, and I'll, I'll tell you the Packers are going away. You could talk to me two right. days. I think the Vikings are going away. Three days, I think it's the Bears. I, I can make a case for all four teams. It's a fascinating division. But anyway, we, we go back to Cam. I think we all yeah. have this default of. Well, Joe Burrow's not going to be very good. He doesn't have an offseason. Justin Herbert can't take the starting job over. He doesn't. Yeah. Well, Cam, Cam did it, and I love Cam. I think and he had Cam a terrible is, preseason too. Remember that yeah, preseason made everyone be like, "Look, bust." See, I told you I was yep. right. And, then, and then he goes to Arizona and throws for four hundred forty-one yards or something yeah. like that, four forty-three, whatever it was. Uh, yeah, and he just set it off for his whole rookie year. So I, I just it's so it's so crazy. We can sit here and try to figure. I think the people who can figure it out, and, and, and I'm just talking in terms of fantasy right now. If people can figure out those edges of home versus road, veteran versus rookie, good yeah. coach versus bad coach, I think you're going to have an edge because they've unlocked the key to something I don't have the answer to right now. And it's not going to be uniform and in, in the same factor in every case, but there'll be ways that we can say like, oh, this is the reason like New Orleans has scored the most points they That's ever cool. have in the first four games of a season or something like that. Like we're going to be able to look at it and now we have a schedule to look at too, to try to mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. some of the shoots and ladders uh, in the season, especially at the beginning where teams, you know, like uh, one of the ones I noticed Frank is the giants. Cause you know, it's going to be, Oh, Jason, uh, yeah. Garrett. Jason Garrett. Jason Garrett is not going to come in there with a light <laughs> touch, right? Like Jason Garrett is not going to come in like we're going to keep some things the same. I think they said like Daniel Jones is going to have to learn a whole new verbiage, whole new system, whole new system. I know he went to Duke and he's smart and all that, but they start with Pittsburgh, Chicago, and San Fran. I know. Whew. I think our fourth game stuff too, if I remember. It's right. The Rams. Yeah, it's, it's still we'll no clue. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Brandon Staley, you know, leaning in on uh, uh, off. And it's great that you mentioned the NFC North too, because 
uh, almost to the last 10 minutes when I like to go off the rails, but I know you've got deep connections to the Packers, right? Yeah. And uh, speaking of hot takes and things like that, like, you know, they were eviscerated for what they did in the draft. Have, have we, and I conclude myself in it, have we been too harsh? No, 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 no. Because, look, I, I mean, if, if you think Jordan Love is a once in a lifetime prospect, I don't believe he is, but uh, he might be. He might be Patrick. Mahomes. But you said once in a know. lifetime. I want to say you said you didn't say like one of the best quarterbacks in this draft or can be a future right. starter or can win games in the NFL. Like that's the other side of the denominator, right? It's like if you think Jordan Love is a player that like you'll be cursed forever if you don't take him, that's why you do this. Right. And it, let's say he's Kirk Cousins, who's a perfectly reasonable NFL quarterback, but I don't think anybody's except for Rick Spielman is jumping off a bridge for right. Kirk Cousins. Maybe Kyle right? like, Maybe Kyle. Yeah, good, good call. If he's, let's say Jordan Love has a Kirk Cousins type career where he's just kind of a, I'm the 14th best quarterback in the NFL for my whole career. Is and that that's what Matt LaFleur wants, by the way, just to be clear. Matt LaFleur right. wants Kirk Cousins. He wants a highly structured quarterback who's going to yes. do and run the offense the way he would do it if he had a remote control. Right. And no matter what we say about Aaron Rodgers right now, he's not a bad quarterback. He's he's a top 10 guy. He's maybe at the, closer to 10 than he was to one uh, five years ago. But he's still a top 10 guy. And to not get him one receiver in the deepest receiver class I've ever seen, probably you agree, I, I thought that that was just it – was, it was amazing to me. It was just – yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, people have said, like, oh, well, Aaron Rodgers is a jerk. Well, if you're waiting around to, to coach a quarterback who's not a jerk, you, you might be <laughs> waiting a while. Like, these guys are built differently. They're wired differently. There, There is ego involved with all these guys. And I just don't get it. I don't understand. And you just look at the timetable. Realistically, the Green Bay Packers can't get out of this for two years. They'd be taking on $31 million in dead cap space. Right. The record is 21, as Brandon Cooks. So you're saying you're going to ten million more than any other dead cap hit in NFL history, right? To move on from Aaron Rodgers, one of the greatest of all time, to Jordan Love, who you have no idea about, and then you get into, will Jordan Love play before the end of his third year when the fifth year fifth year options up? It's just the timeline doesn't make sense. The roster construction doesn't make sense. If the Packers went five and eleven last year, sure, fine, I, right. then I get it. But they they went and to the NFC title game, yeah. And all off season, I just kept saying, wow, they're a star receiver away if they just blow the bank out of Mari Cooper if they do the stuff not, not the device Emmanuel Sanders trade. Emmanuel Sanders anybody or tra draft one of these draft you know I remember I was covering the Packers in two in 99 and Randy Moss had just torched them I think it might have been 2000 actually Randy Moss had just torched them his first couple of years with the Vikings and Ron Wolf went into the draft and he drafted cornerbacks with the first three picks it was Mike McKenzie Antoine Edwards and Fred Vinson and none of them were great but whatever but he just said I'm just going to pick three. And if yeah. a couple, that's fine. And I think a Packer should have done that in a draft. Draft three, draft three receivers. Sure. Why not? And, and if all three hit, hit great. I, I thought it was egregiously bad. And look, maybe Jordan Love is that guy and he's the next Aaron Rodgers. And we're all like, oh, yeah, we're yeah. reacting. I don't think so, man. I just yeah. think Roth is the stretch choice. No, I, I go, the, the NFL, life in the NFL is too short to think about who your quarterback is going to be in 2023. There's going to be another Jordan Love in next year's draft. There's right. going to be another Jordan Love in the 2022 draft. Right. There's just no reason to do it now. It, you, you got to think in such short windows in the NFL. Nobody has a run like the Patriots. Everybody else is on year-to-year -year basically deal yeah. right now. It's terrible. It was terrible. It was terrible. really, really terrible. Um, and the only way it looks good is if Jordan Love it becomes like a top-five quarterback in the NFL. And by putting this kind of pressure on him, you probably lowered the chances that he would be. You know, if they he, if they did go yep. five and eleven, like it'd be a whole different situation for him. And and Frank, like you said, no wide receiver. And th talk about not self scouting. Even if you said, okay, Aaron, like we're not taking wide receiver in the first or second round. I get it. We know you need that, but we need to address the run defense. That was a problem. Right. That was right. maybe part of the right. reason they got drummed out of the playoffs last year. Mm -hmm. They did nothing, nothing uh, at all. And, and, you know, Baltimore goes and gets Calais Campbell, right? Baltimore says Perfect Derek Wolf. Pick, right? right. Baltimore says we're we're gonna get Patrick Queen. We're gonna get uh, Malik Harrison. Like Baltimore says we're not gonna let Tennessee do what they did to us again. San Francisco has they're so oblivious. Like they just blacked out and forgot. Like I mean, not San Francisco. Uh, how San Francisco drummed Green Bay out of the play. Uh, it, was, so, it was weird. Good. And their second round pick didn't make sense. Or third round pick didn't make sense. Nope. It was weird. No, like, it, it, well, they well, want to well, become San Francisco. It's like they want their Kyle use chick and they want to have this yeah. running game. But so notice was, the, I, I, need, I want to ask you something because I need to know. Yeah. What, what do you think of Baltimore this year? Because I look at this as like this team could be like fifteen and one. Right. I I, I think we're underrating because they were one and done, and we just forget about that. 
Right. The Baltimore Ravens of 2019 were a special, nearly yeah. historic regular season team, and I think are better. Uh, I look, one oh, Lamar yeah. Jackson injury could derail this whole thing, but I, I look at this Ravens team like, whoa, we we got something special. They're number yeah. one in my power rankings. I, I think they're going to stay there, even though the Chiefs are great too, just because I I really well, like they get the to, we get to watch them this year. I think the, what it was with the Ravens was again as a Steelers fan watching the draft and knowing that it's going to unfold in this way. They're going to say. Oh. How do they do it every year? How do they, how every year does the draft just create a perfect story right? every every year? And like I said, they already got um, Wolf and they already got uh, uh, Clayus Campbell and Jimmy Smith. I don't understand why Jimmy Smith didn't get more interest in the open market. Like they were able to bring him back like one year, with I know, million right, or something like right. that. So their cornerbacks still look really good. Um, you know, they still have Earl Thomas. Like the defense, and then the big hole in the middle of the defense was the inside linebacker. Um, and they get Patrick Queen and Malik Harrison, and they had an extra second, extra third, and an extra fourth in this draft, which was ridiculous. How does you know, this happen? Like, it's, yeah. yeah, there's like there's like five franchises in the NFL who you could just count on the clockwork. Like, right. they, they're just going to make the smart plays. They're going to make the smart moves. They're going to do everything right. And the Ravens are one of them. And the Ravens are one of the few. I just had a long argument with my good good friend Charles Robinson. Mm. Uh, you know, just about teams thinking outside of the box. And I used the Chargers example, saying. Why don't the Chargers go sign Cam Newton? Who cares? Right? You make your team better. Well, I'm not saying you have to. Cut See, we're gonna do a whole second saying, hour on the whole Cam Newton question, but that's. Oh my god! Like, like everybody admits. Like Anthony Lynn came out and said, "We looked at Cam Newton. He's healthy, but we like our quarterback room." Really? Like, uh, add a fourth one. Who cares? Teams get so caught up in this is the way it's been done since George Hallis in 1942, and we can't be different. And I know you like different. I love different. Right. The Ravens are different. The Ravens are one of the few franchises out there who said, Lamar Jackson is a unicorn. Like We're going to run an offense nobody else has run. We're going to let Greg Roman take this thing over, do what he did with Cam, do what he did with Tyron, and uh, Colin Kaepernick, I mean, not, not Cam. And we are going to turn into this, this basically this college offense, almost like a service academy. Like right. they, they were so hard to prepare for. And I don't think many teams would do that. I think many teams would just say, well, we have Lamar Jackson. Let's try to turn him into a West Coast offense quarterback. Right, right. Well, just like, like what Jordan Love, like what Adam is going to do with Jordan Love. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. bring it all in full circle. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, a, you're not going to embrace the talents that make a player potentially special. You're going to try to just fit a square peg in a round hole. Yeah. And absolutely, um, Baltimore, like you said, embracing risk. Because even just running the quarterback as much as they do, well, he could get hurt. Uh, yeah, you're, you're and I never got that. I never hurt. understood that. And look, yes, I get it. He's more valuable. And if he gets hurt, it, it really ruins your season. But there's no, you know, quarterbacks can slide. They often get it's out never, of bounds. Yeah, it's never been protected. proven that a quarterback is at more risk outside the pocket than inside the pocket. Right, and Lamar's, not a, sm- and Lamar's not a small dude. And I looked at, you know, one example, great example, work done. We love talking about old players, right? Like, whoa, yeah. work done. Like, I love talking about old guys. Work done was like 20 pounds less than Lamar Jackson. He ran, you know, some years he was running 280 times, and he really never got hurt that bad. There's no, there's no, you run your quarterback, you're going to get hurt. No, that's that's not necessarily true. It, no. it, it shortens our career. But again, we talk about the NFL is not a 15-year league. You're not worried about your quarterback in 2032. You're worried about, can we win a Super Bowl Lamar Jackson in his rookie deal? So I, I take my hat. I don't think enough was made of how the Ravens kind of kind of just flew in the face of NFL yeah. convention and said, you know what? Uh, we don't care about what everybody else thinks. We're going to run the most unconventional offense you've seen in the NFL, and we're going to win with it. And they did. And I, I take my hat off to John Harbaugh for saying, I might get ripped for this. Like, Lamar, like that could have failed miserably. Everybody would have laughed at them for running a college offense. But he said, I don't, I don't care. I'm secure in who I am, and, and we're going to do something different because it's the best thing for our team. Yes, and in, it's going to be more difficult to defend now with J.K. Dobbins. And oh. hopefully a healthy Marquise Brown and a healthy and Devin Duvernay. I love Duvernay. Uh-huh. Um, so exciting, exciting times, Ravens. And sorry, Cecil, I'm going to go over an hour because I always like to do a little time at the end. We can let it breathe. Uh, but it's, 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 plus, but the thing is, you're an old, you're an old hand, you're an old pro, and your personality and your soul comes through in your work. And I like that you mentioned Charles Robinson. Charles Robinson's fantastic. Oh, he's great Charles guy. Robinson should be like a household name in NFL circles. Like basically anytime Charles Robinson says anything, I just drop what I'm doing. Like, okay, whoa, what's Charles stuff, talking man. about now? Uh, uh, it's, it, it's fantastic. Um, but I, I'll ask you the same thing. I asked JJ, I asked JJ Zachary on last mm-hmm. week. Uh, and I think that during coronavirus time, um, people have gotten extremely nostalgic. We could even just spend 10 minutes talking about the whole, um, 
last dance Jordan thing and all the ins and outs of that. Um, talk about quarterbacks being not very nice people. Uh, anyway, <laughs> nostalgia, right? Like we're replaying championship runs of teams, mm-hmm. like yeah, and reliving them. Or um, you know, there's there's just a lot of sense of like going back to a happy place. What's your happy place, man? Uh, you know what? I, I don't know why I thought of this, but I, I'll go with it. Uh, you know, when you're talking about just why you know why we became sp- big football fans. Yeah. Right? Now, I'm interested to hear yours because I, I know you're a Steelers fan, but don't don't really know how you know. In me growing up, it's it, the Packers always stuck. I was a Packers fan growing up, born in Milwaukee, uh, went to University of Wisconsin, all that kind of stuff. I know Cheesehead, mm-hmm. and I now I, I cover the. T- I, I don't really have a team. I don't root for the Packers just because I'm too into it. Right? Like you should see me during like a Wisconsin basketball game. <laughs> like I. I, I, I'm just crazy. So I know I can't I, to cover the NFL correctly. I, I can't be a fan and that's fine, but I still will always have the 1996 Packers and just the whole, like this, this great team and the Packers have never won anything. And when I say like January 25th, 1997 was one of the best days of my life. I say that unapologetically, like it was mm-hmm. great. And I was so I, I covered the mountain West for a little bit. and saw Aaron Taylor, who you remember, you know, like mm-hmm. from Notre Dame, he was on that Packers team and he's now with the mountain West network. And I pulled the whole, it was a uh, football media days. I pulled the whole, like Chris Farley SNL, like, wasn't it so cool in the 19, 19- I, I, I talked his ear off for like a half hour, just being a fanboy mm-hmm. about the 96 Packers. And so you talk about happy place. Old games is my thing. I watch them all the time on YouTube. Like, yeah, YouTube is a treasure trove of games. Like it is amazing. So I, I just think of those mid '90s Packers season. Like the '94 season was so fun with the throwbacks and just my my interest in the NFL grew. NFL prime time was a big part of my life. Paul Zimmerman, big part of my life. So when you talk about happy places, I always think of football because football's so great. And I always think of those years when I was just really, really getting into it. And hey, what, what was it for you? Like, what, yeah. was there a player? Was there a game? Was there a, a team? Like, a- well, you know, my story with football. See, this is where I'm going to probably alienate some people because, of course, going up in Western Pennsylvania, I was born in 1975. Yeah, um, 76. So we're saying. But really, my first vivid football memory is like the Kellen Winslow game. Or yes, um, yes, me too, me too. Yeah, yeah. So, so well, I wasn't on board for the Steelers championships. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I was not part of that wave, but everything was so Steelers obsessed that you could not, sure. not be part of it. My sister, I always tell the story that my sister became a Cowboys fan just to be a rebel, you know, just to show <laughs> that she wasn't on board. She's like, well, I'm a Cowboys fan. Like that's, that's how it much it's the religion. It is. It's, hey, it's the, Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah I mean, have you right. been to Lambeau field by the way? I have not. Oh, I have only been through sick. like Madison and uh, for Alpine Valley. I understand. That, hey, you know, this is the time with the gas prices. It's like 1990s fish tour all <laughs> over again. And we could like tour the country, get on the great American road, do the great American road trip. Yeah, but exactly. I'll, the other, the, you know, the commonality, there's a lot of commonality here though. Um, Cause when I think of Western Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, what I think of Frank is like alcoholism is normalized. Oh, yeah, like yeah. there's a there's a bar in every neighborhood, and mm-hmm. thankfully there is a bar in every neighborhood. So it's not as much driving drunk driving, but it's like there's a place. Um, and I don't mean to say this in any kind of negative way. I mean, I, I, when we moved back to Pennsylvania when I was seven, my grandparents ha- ran a coal miner bar, and we lived in the attic, and my mom and aunt were the bartenders. You know? Oh yeah, that's a common I mean, thing in Wisconsin for sure. Yeah, and, and uh, the whole like it, love the of intensity is... and the religiosity of it, oh, I think, it's... are tied into that. Absolutely. You go to some place like, like you should, like I, anybody listening, go to Green Bay for a game once in your life. Right. I, I don't care what it costs. Like just, it is a, uh, it is an event. Like it's like Lambeau Field is in the middle of a neighborhood. Now they've built it up. They have the whole title right. thing going on, but it used to be when I covered them for three years, it was, it's like, all right, there's a Burger King and there's a gas station with a subway in it. And there's a uh, Kmart and there's Lambeau Field and there's Pizza Hut. And there, it was just, it's in the middle of a neighborhood basically. And it's this like, great old place and there's there's the the nfl teams who play in green bay actually stay in appleton 40 minutes away right because there's no hotel in green bay big enough for an nfl team <clears throat> seriously right. like that's the reason right. they don't have there there are connected to casinos but the nfl doesn't do that and we, you know, whatever so just yes the I, I know like i live in denver now based out here and people love the broncos for sure but i yes. always tell them like it's, it's emotional it's, there's an emotional there's a deep emotion i feel like the broncos fans are more optimistic like just tell me something good tell me something good about the broncos <laughs> make me feel good about the broncos give me something to look forward to but there it isn't as 
it, it, like, I mean, Bel- Elway and all that stuff, like, kind of put it in D- the DNA. But it's just, what I always say is, like, Packers and Steelers, these are teams named after the main occupation of the people that live yes, and support yes. the team. And it's it's, it's just different. It's, it, there's a few teams. Uh, I think the Cowboys are one. The Cowboys have a great Cowboys fans fan. can be fair weather fans. Sorry, they Cowboys can. fans. There's a lot I, of I lived in uh, Texas. So, and, like, you know, you're, you're growing up in the 80s. Or, you, you know, your your touch points aren't necessarily Terry Bradshaw and Joe Green. It's Louis Lips. It's Mark Malone. Sure. Right? Like, right. like those guys. Like, like, was there a game where you're like, was it the Kellen Winslow game? You're probably too young. But was there a game or a season where you're just like, I, I am all in. I love football well, the rest of my I, life. The, gonna, the Steelers, I'm going to give up being a lawyer to, to be a right, big right, shot right. football guy. Okay, so you, you, know? you were asking me that. And I can't go. This could threaten to go on forever and ever. Because I can't <laughs> tell a story without telling another story to give context for the story. So I do remember in 83, the Steelers, in the strike-shortened year, the Steelers had a good team and got and went up 14 nothing, I think. And then got beaten in that game in the strike short and playoffs. Then they went to the AFC title game against the Marino Dolphins. Mm-hmm. John Stallworth's last great ride. Um, but right. they didn't they they couldn't get past the Dolphins. And then there was a little bit of a, a winter for the team. But the game that I can remember that got me really, really excited to be a Steelers fan again was um, the playoff win at Houston. And Rod Woodson. And then they went to Denver and should have beaten Denver, all but beat. Denver, Merrill Hodge, you know, all but beat Denver in that game. And that got the juices flowing again. And then Bill Cower comes on and, and, and the rest is history. But in between that time, as a football fan, I was actually an Eagles fan. I loved the Buddy Ryan Eagles. Really? I oh, loved the Randall Cunningham yeah. buddy. What a wonder, what a team. I can't believe that team never never at least made a Super Bowl. Um, and I was now. also yeah. a baseball fan. I used to sit yeah, in the room and hand score the Pirates games. And those were some terrible Pirates teams. Oh. But I, Dude, know, I'm I had, a like, Brewers fan. Who, who are you talking about? You bad had, baseball. You, that was Harvey Walls, Harvey's Wall Bangers, <laughs> right? I mean, that that those were fun. The Robin Yount, like those oh, yeah, Brewers yeah, teams were yeah. fantastic. Um, but um, like I had 15 baseball cards for every football card or basketball mm-hmm. card or mm-hmm. hockey card I had. That is until Mario and Yaramir and everything like that. But it really is like you can embrace all, all of it, you know, because sports in all of these different corners of sports has something really compelling. Um, um, self-affirming of your humanity in some ways because it makes you f- feel something. Because I, I mean, in some ways, Frank, you and I talking on the show right now in this moment comes back to when we were talking about du- the Buster Douglas, Mike Tyson fight. Oh, sure, you were yeah. so so kind to send me the definitive book about right, but what that fight. Yeah. And again, like nostalgia, right? It's something like we can remember. And also Buster Douglas beating Mike Tyson at that time, if you were into boxing, my stepfather uh, may he rest in peace was a professional boxer. And I we had oh. there was a boxing gym um, that I would go to where he would train boxers. He trained world champions there. Um, and he uh, it's funny too because you got your mask, Frank. I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah, it's not around, but yeah. You sure. got your mask though, right? And yep. we ride, I'll, I'll, I'll wear it sometimes like for like riding our bike or something and it sweats just nasty and I forgot to wash it and it smelled like the boxing gym and I had to confess oh, nice. to my wife, like I actually kind of liked the way it smelled because it reminded me of going to this boxing gym, Colic AC, out in the hoots and hollers of Western Pennsylvania where we would pick like wild blackberries uh, on the grounds and, um, you know, it just reminded me of being at the gym, and I was, those were happy memories for me. Um, but but if you were into boxing, and who wasn't? I mean, like oh, Mike. Ty- I mean, yeah. who or who at least didn't understand the the phenomenon that Mike Tyson was? Mm-hmm. I mean, he wasn't just a sports hero, anti-hero, whatever. He was a phenomenon. Yeah, uh, like a force of nature. And when he lost, and you watched it, and it wasn't just that he lost, because if you watch that fight in real time. He watched it, and going in, it was really maybe the biggest mismatch of the whole Mike Tyson era. They weren't even, they weren't even taking bets yeah, on it. 38 to 1, 42 to 1, was it? Right, yeah, and it was yeah, in, yeah. In, in in Japan, uh-huh. in a, like, a big cavernous arena, so it was an odd setting. It wasn't like the classic glitzy like Caesar's Palace or something like that. Right. And you were watching it, and immediately you're like, man... This guy, and you heard the stories, right? Like, what was it? Buster Douglas, is, was it his mother who had died? Yeah, yes. His and and, yes. and he was saying, like, not in a Mike Muhammad Ali brash way, but he's like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to win. I'm going to shock the world, whatever. And I but think that's the, one of the few sporting events that uh-huh. everybody remembers where they were. Like, did yeah. you watch it live? I didn't watch yes. it live. Yes. Okay, yes. I didn't. I woke up the next morning and CNN headline news. I would watch it 20 and 50 after the hour, right? That's how we got pre-internet kids. Like, we didn't know. And when they said Tyson lost to Buster Douglas, I didn't believe it until the next half hour. I was like, 
I, I think I just heard that wrong. I'm going to have to wait until 50 minutes after the hour and right. watch that report again. Right. That's how shocking it was. Like, it, no, I literally I, watched the report and I was like, that, that can't be true. Mike Tyson can't lose. It, like, it can't, right. And you, if you watch the fight in real time, you watched it and you saw immediately. Because remember, we had started out with Mike Tyson as like, Professional boxers were scared of him. You could see in their oh, body yeah. language, like Michael Spinks. You know, Michael like they Spinks were afraid didn't want to of come him. out and fight. Like there's yeah, a like, great like, story in that in that book you're talking about, where if you watch rewatch the Spinks fight, Spinks is like has no sweat on him because he didn't shadow box in the locker room before because he told his guys, "I'm not going out there to fight him." So yeah, when you look at Spinks, he's totally dry in the ring because he didn't warm up because he didn't want to go fight him. Anyway, it's like primal. Like Mike Tyson, even watching him on TV, you could feel the primal fear. Of, yes. of what Tyson would bring out to you. So Buster Douglas, who was Buster Douglas? Buster Douglas didn't back down from him at all, and Buster Douglas had a plan, and Buster Douglas was executing that plan. And as you're watching this, you're like, wow, I, we're watching someone like actually boxing Mike Tyson. Like This looks like yeah. a... a and, then it, and then it kept going, and it kept going, and then he knocked Douglas down, and then I was like, oh, okay, the universe is going to reassert balance, and everything's going to be back to normal. But no. Right. And, and if you go when, back and look at the, the broadcast, it's not Lampley, the other one. that is Merchant? On is it Merchant? I, I don't but Whoever the play-by-play -play guy is. The first few rounds, it's funny re-watching it because he's yeah. like basically like patting the guy in the back like it's a little league wow. game. Like, hey, yeah. Buster Douglas hasn't been knocked out yet. Great show, Buster. And then right. it keeps going and going and going. You're like, well, something's happening here. It's just, And I think the really telling Jim Lampley, one of the great play-by-play -play yeah. guys of all time, when the fight's over, the first thing he says is, Mike Tyson has been knocked out. It's right. not Buster Douglas one. It is Mike Tyson has right. been knocked out. That was the story. And it's how often is that where the story is the team that lost, right? Or the guy who lost it. Right. Down goes, Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Yeah. Well, and the thing was, um, at the, I, I so well, my reaction was, Frank, is I called everybody that I knew. And it was like 10 something on a Friday night when it happened. Mm -hmm. And I called everybody that I knew. I called everybody like Mike Tyson just got knocked out. Mike Tyson just lost. Mike Tyson just lost to Buster Douglas. Oh my God. <laughs> Hang up, call someone else. Oh my God. Um, but it was as, as much as anything, I guess we had like the miracle on ice, but again, we were too young for that. Uh, yeah. So it really was this moment that, that signified like anything can happen. Like right. really and, yeah. mm -hmm. anything can happen. Like in, and, and it's something we should take and like tuck away in our, our, our back pocket just to remind ourselves, right. Anything can happen. Right. Cause I mean, this is a time and I'll try. It, it's funny. And I'll, I'll end. I'll end on this note so we don't go on forever and ever. And Frank, <laughs> obviously, you'll, you'll, you, I'll have you back. This is longer, but we should have been doing this like three, four, five times that. a year for a long time, man. Um, built, and I'm down here in New Orleans, so I can say like building back from zero, better than you were before, is what America does. It's what we do as it's what our story of our country is, right? Like everybody who came here started out from zero, right? Yep. Everybody who came here, well, not everybody, because I can get into like. <laughs> yeah, some, people already know my thoughts on all these different things but basically the story of america is starting from zero and um sports reminds us of that right i mean like yeah. sports you know the dennis rodman part of the last dance where like rodman was basically like homeless like his you know his his mom was like you got to take care you got to be able to fend for yourself because I, I don't see you doing it and he had to like whatever couch surf you know kind of just exist and and he becomes Dennis Rodman. And, who, and by the way, what an interesting revelation that Madonna was the one who was in his ear saying, like, just be yourself. <laughs> right. You know? I mean, uh, there, there could have if been any, a 10-episode series on Dennis Rodman and Madonna, and I'd have watched it. Like, it's, no there's, there's a really interesting documentary about Madonna before she got famous and all the people she hung out with and knew her. And she's one of those people that always just wanted to be famous. Like, she was obsessed with being famous and she was going to find a way like water trying to find a crack in the dam she was going to find a way to be famous anyway that's a whole other thing it's interesting though it's fascinating it's just, every story is fascinating if it's told in the right way you should be reading uh frank schwab telling stories yahoo you should already know him yahoo schwab s-c-h-w-a-b now you fully come to life frank um and I know I think you've been on the show a couple times before to be uh, and everything, but it, it's been a while though. And I love you know the funny thing is like I I was a fan of you guys before I met you guys. Like I, you know it's funny like you would think like I'm really good friends with Cecil. Obviously, I, I was a fan of you guys in the Audible before I even met Cecil. I saw Cecil at a Broncos practice. I've been listening to you guys for I'm a big fantasy football guy. I love it. Uh, I wish we could have talked about that for an hour because I'd have picked your brain instead of you know, next football. Time. 
but uh, you know, I went up to Cecil at a Broncos practice. I was like, Hey, I, I really like, you know, what you guys do. It's really good football talk. It's very entertaining. It's very informative. He's like, Oh, thanks. Friendship grew out of that. I remember meeting you at, in Dallas, I believe mm -hmm. at a practice and saying, Hey, I really like, so it's, it's one of those funny things of like, I, I have, it's weird to be on with you because I listen when JJ's on, when Evan's on, when all these guys are on. It's, it's one of the few podcasts that's always in the IDP stuff. I love the IDP. Yes. Stuff. I, I, I still need to listen. I know you guys just put out an episode recently. I need to listen to it. I listen to you guys more than I, I contribute. And contribute is kind of weird. It's like, yeah, I'll drop everything to be on, on the audio. Oh. It's phenomenal. You're too kind, and it's fun that we've been doing this long enough now to see all these changes and players that we've watched as rookies have already retired, and we're Dra still here. Draft guys TV along. Draft so, guys oh, hey. TV. We're getting. See, I know the inside yeah, jokes. I know. I know. We're get, with, again. You're one. Uh, it, it, Frank Schwab. Because so real quick, I really lose to you. Uh, real, yeah, <laughs> not often. Real quick. So I yeah. hate to say this, you're gonna not like me for this, but. I thought football guys was such an edge in fantasy football that I didn't want to tell any of my friends about it. Yes. I'll be honest with you. I, I'll be totally honest. Yep, yep. And so like, you know, I, I didn't know anybody knew about it. And then I was on with you guys, I think as a Broncos beat writer. And one of my buddies who I've, I'm in a bunch of leagues with been in an IDP dynasty league for, I think 19 years now, texts me or emails me or whatever it was at the time says, Hey, nice job on football guys. And I was like, ah, oh, my secrets out. Like, I, yeah, you know, now it's everybody knows. It's 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 a bittersweet thing because I mean I, I don't think anybody at football guys wants to get big you know well I mean Cecil Cecil will eventually be big I mean <laughs> I, I always tell timer, Cecil man. you should go is, out with him he, sometime I I, know, I, I go out I know, with Cecil I, I kind of keep to myself and Cecil's the man out there he's oh like, hey, I know every year know coming me? back to Denver every yes. year it's beautiful because he brings joy to people and people connect with his inner joy and enthusiasm and I always tell him like when I see like the twenty foot billboard of your head on I twenty five that's when I know we did it. You know, like that's you what I want to see is driving into Denver. I want to see your big mug, like 20 feet, 25 feet high. Um, but it's wonderful. It's always a story of relationships. Football is a story of relationships. All of our lives are story of relationships. We love all of you showing up for the live show and everybody out there listening. It looks more and more every day. May continue to be more positive that we will have a season and all these other things. But no matter what, we'll keep each other company uh, with the help of great people like Frank Schwab. And as always, folks, uh, wash your hands, wear your mask, social distance, you know, stay safe out there, but yeah, live your life.